what these kids basically have is they have non-diagnostic tachycardia. Uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is a, it's, it's not uncommon, it's about one in 700 kids. Uh, so if you've got 50,000 kids in the school district, I mean, do the math. You're gonna have some kids with, this is an inborn situation where a child has an extra, what we call electrical pathway in the heart. And uh, th these hearts can go uh, out of rhythm and uh, they can be triggered by situations that can disturb heart rate variability. And as a cardiologist, knowing what I know now, uh, it's easy for me to connect the dot that a child with Wolf Parkinson White, undiagnosed, exposed to Wi-Fi, could be triggered with an arrhythmia. Uh, Superventricular tachycardias are uh, what we call SVTs, and uh, adults and kids have these all the time, and uh, again, because uh, Wi-Fi disturbing uh, uh, heart rate variability, it could be a factor in children. Uh, Wi-Fi in the heart, um, basically, I mean, clearly more scientific investigation needs to be considered. Uh, Clearly, there are children and adults out there uh, with undiagnosed cardiac problems. I mean, even as an adult cardiologist, I would see adult people in their 40s and 50s who have a hole in their heart that was undiagnosed until they went into heart failure. Or I would, I would see uh, women who had severe mitral valve prolapse who had a ruptured what we call cordae tendinii, had, didn't even know it, and then all of a sudden would go into heart failure. Uh, and, and the problem here is that uh, with children and adults uh, with these undiagnosed situations. And now you bring them into an environment that could adversely affect the heart, could anything happen? So we have to ask our question, uh, can Wi-Fi or any form of toxic RF set the stage for a life-threatening arrhythmia in a vulnerable individual? That's the question we have to ask. Now, do we want to wait for decades of research as we did with the tobacco industry? I mean, the tobacco industry fought that for years and the jury came follow, is out on that, that, okay, tobacco causes, you know, lung cancer. Th same thing occurred with radon. You know, radon, everybody's afraid of, and radon is really big in the, in the northeast United States, where I live in Connecticut, as well as Canada. A lot of houses are built on granite rock here, and, and everybody gets their homes tested for radon. And, and we know that radon, when it seeps through the earth and into your body, it's a big cause for lung cancer, despite the fact that many patients with lung cancer who are exposed to radon don't smoke. Uh, so it took years of research to show that. But when a real estate agent comes to your house and says, do you want it to radon checked? Of course you say, yeah, I'll have it checked. You know? Now radon is like EMF and RF. You can't feel it, you can't taste it, you can't see it, you can't smell it, but it's, it's a silent killer, just like RF is. So we don't want to wait for decades of research. So what do we do now? And, and, and my suggestion here is really to use the precautionary principle and do we make our schools safer now? And, and I like to rationalize the precautionary principle and I'll just read it to you. Actually, my, my daughter did this on my website. You know, she's an attorney and, uh, and she just took this out and, and, and wrote this up and she said, under the precautionary principle, the threat of plausible, serious, and irreversible hazards to children from exposure to particular environmental stimuli justify public policy action to reduce such exposure, even though scientific uncertainty or ignorance may preclude findings of a true hazard. Waiting for such proof may be more damaging to the public health in the long run. And I embrace this principle. This is the principle that I think you guys should be using in Toronto. This is the principle that your legislatures need to follow. 